1 Corinthians chapter 13. I love this chapter. Um, if, I, if I speak in the tongue of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clinging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand the mysteries and all knowledge, and I have and I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrong in wrongdoings, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only part, and we prophesy only in part. But when, we com when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in the mirror dimly, <coughs> but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully even as I have been known fully. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. The word of God for all the people. Amen. Thanks, Thanks be God. God. <laughs> Let's be a moment of prayer together. May the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. If I get this up high enough, everybody hearing okay? Uh, picture this scene, if you would. It's dusk, and this couple is sitting on the ocean beach. The sand is warm to the touch. Probably not what it is today. But it's warm to the touch. The sun is just about to set. Kissing the surface of the ocean. A spirit of romance comes over the young woman. Without taking her eyes off the ocean and sun, she says, isn't that sunset gorgeous? The fellow replies, Well, strictly speaking, the sun is not setting. Nor for that matter does it ever set. The sun, you see, is fixed, relatively fixed in relation to the earth. So to speak precisely, it would be more accurate to say that the earth is rising. A great answer for Jeopardy, <laughs> but an absolutely stupid answer for when you have a beautiful young lady sitting beside you on an evening at the ocean. Now, I, I may be a little harsh on him, but I think that that probably could have been the Apostle Paul. He was very uh, rational, very uh, uh, dogmatic, if you will. And he was very, uh, uh, a good thinker, great thinker, but almost too systematic in his theology and, uh, and, and rather humorous when you read Paul. You don't get a lot of hidden humor in there here and there, uh, probably when, if people had their chance, the men would have said, did you ever get an answer for those letters to Corinth? Or the women might say, because of his, some of his attitude toward women, 
which isn't the most positive, they might have said, what kind of mother did you have, anyway, to grow up with these attitudes that you have toward women? Paul was what people would call a left brain thinker. You know, the left brain and right brain. It's reckoned that the left brain governs the right side of our body and is a part that thinks logically, systematically, uh, dogmatically, if you will. It, it, it's the part that this fellow on the beach, well, strictly speaking, the sun is not setting, you know, in the, in the, and that's, a, that, that's a, a left brain response to a right brain moment, you might say. Uh, but you decide whom you will marry, not by this left brain. You don't go through your address book and say, well, let me see, well, that's good, he's good, yeah, no. or she's, she's good, yeah, 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 boom. That, that's kind of a left brain type of thing. You, you, you decide who you're going to marry because you had some relationship with the person and you, and you fall in love with them, you, you like them. They're, they're, uh, uh, they're attractive to you and you're attracted to them. So that's, that's a right brain working. And then uh, the left brain says, okay, takes over and says, uh, now we gotta set the date for the wedding. And so the date is set, the plans are made, all mostly left brain activity that drives most grooms crazy. And, and uh, the left brain, and, and you wanna be sure that the left brain is doing it because you don't wanna schedule the wedding, wedding on the day of your colonoscopy. <laughs> Or, or open heart surgery. You, you don't want it. You, you don't want to have those two or four days before to be screwed up by a colonoscopy. So you know. So so you, you think through it, and you uh, your your uh, your left brain makes good decision. Paul is rather cool and logical almost all the time. Early part of Corinthians. Could you imagine trying to put this to music, Alan? And to the unmarried and to the widows, I say this, it is a good thing. If, like me, they stay as they are, but if they do not have self-control, they should marry. It is better to be married than to burn with desire. Now, those words don't exactly rhyme. They would be hard to put to music. In uh, 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 but then you, you come across this passage that uh, Joanne read for us this morning, and you're, you're suddenly uh, switched over to this part of the brain, to the right brain. And this is uh, one of the few times in all the letters of Paul, and Paul probably writes more uh, in the New Testament than anybody else. In 2 Corinthians, Thessalonians, goes on and on. Not, not all the New Testament after the Gospels is by Paul, but an awful lot of it. Romans and, and so many other things. But there's moments in there, and one of them is this passage that we heard read this morning uh, in 1 Corinthians 13. It's one that many of us perhaps memorized as a child. We may have memorized it when they have the word charity in there for love. And it's poetry. And it works for music. <clears throat> Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I am become as a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I understand all mysteries and have all knowledge, if I have not charity or love, I am nothing. In this point, there are words that evoke a noise. Sounding brass, clanging cymbal. There are words that conjure up pictures. Now we see puzzling reflections in the mirror. Well, then we'll see face to face. 
And there are very evocative lines that we might want to chew over. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child. But now that I've grown up, there are no long sentences. There's nothing difficult in here. Um, it's a poem that probably is selected more often for weddings. Than any other scripture. I'm, I'm sure of that. At least in my limited experience. It's the one somebody would like somebody in the family to read or, or the minister. That's, that's right brain stuff. You put that stuff to music. We have a beautiful hymn, The Gift of Love, in our hymnal that's based on that. And, uh, and, and it's not that hard to, uh, to, to see why that, uh, that attracts us. And then Paul, and pa Paul can't go on too long, you know, he doesn't he want to be too right brain, so he switches over to the left brain, even in the middle of this beautiful poem. He says, uh, it turns negative all of a sudden. Love envies no one, is never boastful, is never arrogant, rude, or conceited, never selfish, never quick to take offense. Love keeps no score of wrongs, takes no pleasure in the sins of others. Just when this right brain muse had taken over Paul, boom, the left brain gains over him at this point. And you, uh, you, you, you hear the knots in the nevers. But, Paul is right. It's a combination of the two, love. It's right brain and it's left brain. It's romance and wonderful feelings of joy, fantasy, you name it. Imagination. And it needs to be rational. It isn't just about feelings. It's much more. It is what, what um, you know, what needs to be done to make it work. Love, love, not only in our marriage relationships, but in our inner, re inner uh, relationships with other people. Uh, both need to be there. Now, I'm not a composer of music. I did actually write a hymn once to the to a tune of a Christmas song, and, and we sung it one of the churches. It didn't ascend to number one, so. You know. But it, it was on the, it was on a text that says that God's love is new every morning, and. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with the words, but if a composer gets a, a get, gets hold of these last words of, of Paul, and, and I don't know if Ellen's ever composed music or not, but she certainly plays it beautifully, and, and uh, uh, as as Faith plays beautifully, and uh, but when a uh, composer is fatuated with a musical idea. It'll buzz a bell in their head, as John Bell, who uh, writes many hymns and com has composed much music, traveled the realm. He's originally from the Iona community in Scotland. And uh, he's a uh, wonderful, I hope someday that maybe, you know, maybe he'll be in this area and you take uh, advantage to go hear him. You, I, I'm told that he wears red tennis shoes wherever he goes, and whether he's preaching or not, and uh, very colorful. But he says, when a composer decides on music, uh, such as, say, this uh, poem, he has to decide on a key. He has to decide on a structure. He has to think about which instruments might play the piece or which voices might sing it, left brain activity. To these 
Do these decisions limit his passionate idea? No, they allow the idea to be refined and communicated to others. When a poet feels inspired by a particular thought, she has to think about words to express it, about length of verses, about rhyme and suitable vocabulary. Does this limit her creativity? No. It allows the passionate idea to be expressed intelligently. So when Paul, in the middle of his passionate enthusiasm for love, begins to outline some caveats and suggested guidelines, it is not to spoil the fun. It is to enable the marvel and mystery of love to be communicated and to be understood. Love is both passion and logic, both romance and reason. And love is not blind, you know. Uh, some people treat it like it is, but you and I, we, I'm sure you can think of families, and maybe we've been guilty of them ourselves, and, and maybe I have too, for that matter. But we all know parents who are over so overprotective of their child that they never let the child become an independent teenager or adult. And there's a risk in having somebody grow up because we don't know, you know, it's a, it's a hard world. But there sometimes is so much overprotection that the person never flowers to become who they're supposed to be. It's, 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 it's a love which is blind not only to the needs of the child, but it's blinded the person's self. You know, where you can't even see that you, what harm you're doing the one you love. And that's, uh, you know, that's crucial to, to know ourselves well enough to be able to say, Carol, you're dealing with this with your own insecurity, don't cast it on to your boys or to your grandchildren. Yeah. Now, my boys didn't make a lot of, <coughs> they didn't make any horrible mistakes. They made mistakes. That was their mother's influence. <laughs> <laughs> She's not here, is she? <laughs> you scratch that. You know? Please uh, eliminate that from the that, that was a, the church members' influence. There, that's what's safer. But anyhow, uh, when when um, a mistake is made by a child. Love doesn't, isn't blind to that mistake. We need to help them to see what they've done. And if somebody in, in, uh, in our relationships or on the job that we are, if someone is making a mistake, you don't want them to be blind to that mistake. You want to help them to become what they can be. And that's when, you know, this whole part, kind of, your, your left brain kicks in. We may know of couples, for example, whose relationships have been stormy as they dated. You know, they're always, ah, I hate him. The next moment, you know, they're out together. Oh, it's, ah, I don't know. And you go out to eat with them. Ah, 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 and you say, boy, I hope they, I hope they, <laughs> cut this relationship as quick as they can, and then one day they announce, we'll get married and it will be all right. <laughs> no, no, they'll get married and it'll still be all wrong, you know, because they'll still be at one another's throat. When our love is something that involves decision-making, choice, and not just going on how we feel, 
then that is a love which makes a difference. Jesus has an instance in his life which I think we talked about a few weeks ago. But there's a time when a woman comes up to him and begs him for help. Her daughter is very sick. The problem is, she is a Syrophoenician. She's not Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. I used to argue with my kids, who was the first Christian? They'd say, Jesus. I said, no, you know, you remain Jewish all the way. You know? <clears throat> you didn't suddenly become Christian on, on the cross. And, and, and she, he, he understands that he has said to the Jewish people, she has a need. She begs him. They had that conversation. Remember the, about the crumbs on the table? He said, I've, sent to, I've been sent to the chosen people. I'm not sent to you. And, I, I'm, and he even goes so far as to say, I'm not sent to you who are dogs. An insult. And she comes back very beautifully. She says, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the table. And it's almost those words which tear open the heart of Jesus. And he says, woman, your daughter will be healed. Your faith has made her whole. Now, Jesus is brought up with this left brain activity. I'm for the Jews. I'm Jewish. I'm not over there for this other ethnic group, for the Syro. That's all left brain. There's a right brain of Jesus who tells us to love one another with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, to love God that way, to love, to love God that way in our neighbors as ourselves. There, there's this part which is so strong in Jesus. And the two conflict right at that point. Which is it? <coughs> it's the woman's faith that converts Jesus to be loving there. Her faith awakens him to what it is that God really wants him to do. Which isn't just for the Jews. It's for the whole world. And the love breaks through. So that later, John is able to summarize the whole message of Jesus. That Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. And that's why we have a worldwide communion last week. Why we are called to reach out to one another. Why we are really called <laughs> to get the brain together, if you will. And don't use the left brain excuse, I can't do that. And the right brain says, love one another. May we share it.